writing task one academic, we're just going to talk about simple bar graphs today. Writing task one academic is worth one third of your writing score, but it's just as important as writing task two, even though it's only worth half as much. And the reason is just mathematics. If you get band seven on writing task two, but you get six and a half on writing task one, you're going to end up with six and a half. So in essence, they're both equally important from a practical perspective. You would have to get band seven and a half on writing task two if you got six and a half on writing task one. And it's extremely difficult to get seven and a half on writing task two. Right, so you can't neglect these. Writing task one academic is not easy. You have to describe data, you have to describe patterns, and you have to do it quickly. It's 150 to 200 words and you only have 20 minutes to do it. People struggle to identify the patterns they need to talk about. The only real way to get fast at this at identifying the patterns and deciding what to talk about is to practice a lot, is to see a lot of examples and just to get accustomed to the language. Now, this is not the kind of language we're used to using with our friends on a daily basis. If you're going into university, you absolutely must know this kind of language because every kind of essay, every kind of project that you do has to be supported by data. And the language that you use in this task is exactly the same language you would use on an essay to support your ideas with data. Uh, scientists, doctors, engineers, uh, liberal arts majors, everyone has to be comfortable using this language, which is why this task is on the examination. Okay, so it's very much a real world task. This is a typical prompt. They'll give you a chart, and this one is fairly straightforward. It might be a bar graph, it might be a line graph, it might be a combination where they give you two different types of graphs. You could get like a pie chart and a bar graph. They'll give you this little prompt at the top that says the chart below shows the total number of minutes and billions of telephone calls in the UK. Sorry, it's a typo there. Divided into three categories from 1995 to 2002. Summarize the information by selecting and reporting the main features and make comparisons where relevant. Okay, so the instructions, the second part, it's always the same. And the first part is just the most general description of the graph. That's your context. Okay, so let's talk about the principles of writing an effective um, IELTS, sorry, should be task one description. In terms of task achievement. So we'll look at the rubric in. Uh, this is the writing task one rubric. It's the same. Uh, well, this rubric has both task one academic and task two general success criteria. Today, we'll just talk about the academic success criteria. So you must start with a clear overview of main trends and differences. And that's right here. The second point in band seven, task achievement. <clears throat> this is equivalent to the context and thesis statement in an essay. So the general overview is your introductory paragraph. And it simply consists of paraphrasing the prompt they give you, plus writing a summary of the main patterns in the graph. Okay, I, I wanna point something out. In a lot of examples online, you'll see this general overview at the end. To me, that is really weird and it's bad writing. Information texts always proceed from general to specific. So the general overview always belongs at the beginning. Don't ever put it at the end. It serves no purpose there after the person has already read all of your specific information. It's completely useless at the end. 
Okay. Now the key features that you must summarize. Uh, the last point in task achievement says clearly presents and highlights key features you do so in one to three body paragraphs as appropriate for the task. And when it says key features, you cannot neglect any of the information. You can't ignore any of the data. You won't get band seven if you do so. Another point, don't interpret any of the information. This is a purely descriptive writing task. Even if you're an expert on this topic and you have extensive background knowledge, don't mention it. Pretend you're completely ignorant on this topic. Your description has to be limited just to what is in the diagram, nothing else. Point four, you must support your descriptions of the main patterns with data. This is one of the big problems that I see, that in people's body paragraphs, they just talk about what the patterns are, but they don't mention the data. So you can't simply describe the overall patterns without mentioning specific data. And this is common practice in any kind of report or essay that you write. First, you explain what the general idea is, and then you support all of your ideas with specific data. <clears throat> Like in this case of uh, the UK telephone cell phones, so the data it will be from the paragraph, like supporting the body from the paragraph, right? Yes, so the pattern is, for example, the, the red bars here, which describe local fixed line calls. You'll notice, for example, that the beginning point is in the low 70s. Yes. And then the end point is also in the low 70s. Okay, so this is 70 billion minutes uh, per year. So the overall pattern is that it went up and it went down and it ended up at basically the same place where it started. Okay. Right? Yes. But in the body paragraphs, you have to provide the supporting data for these points. It doesn't mean every single point, but it means you need to put the start point, the end point, you generally want to discuss the highest points, the lowest points, and you need to provide the specific data for there. So in this case, you could talk about how it started off at 70 something billion minutes per year. It rose and it reached a peak of roughly 90 billion minutes and then declined to uh, the low 70s again, which is where it started. But you have to give that data to support your ideas. That's mandatory. You have to point out the patterns. This is another common mistake. You can't just list the data. The instructions always say, make comparisons where relevant. Okay, so think about it this way. Why did the author or designer create the graph? What point were they trying to make, right? Why did they draw this thing? Why did they select these dates? Why did they select these numbers? What is the purpose of putting this information in a graph? If they just wanted to dump all the information on you, they would just give you an Excel spreadsheet that lists all the information. But people put information, people put data into graphs because that helps them visualize the patterns in the data. So that's what they're after here. Why did this person design this specific graph? What did they want to show you? People ask about making mistakes. So where it says band six here, at the bottom, details may be irrelevant, inappropriate, or inaccurate. Any kind of inaccuracy, any kind of inaccuracy will bring you below band seven. Doesn't matter if it's a small mistake, the examiner has no choice. Uh, like I've mentioned elsewhere, the prompt, so the graph and the description, and the rubric, you can think of them as a legal agreement between you, IELTS, and the examiner. And if they spot a mistake, 
they have to give you a band six. They have no choice. Okay. Last point about task achievement. This is not an essay. Don't write a conclusion. You've got an intro and then one to three body paragraphs and that's it. This is really short, 150 to 200 words in two minutes and 20, min in 20 minutes, uh, there's no conclusion. Okay, are there any questions about task achievement? Let's move on to coherence and cohesion. Similarly with the essay, you need to use transitions abundantly. Don't assume that the reader is going to understand how your ideas are connected to each other. Use language like first of all, second of all, however. These words indicate how ideas are connected to each other. Be super explicit. Second point, the order of information in your general overview must match the order of information in the body paragraphs. Otherwise, it's confusing. So if you, in the general overview, you mentioned pattern one, and then you mentioned pattern two, your first body paragraph is gonna be about pattern one. And then the next body paragraph is gonna be about pattern two. Don't flip things around. It just confuses the reader. In terms of the structure, it's a fairly simple structure. In the introduction, you paraphrase the prompt. This step is just automatic. So in this case, where it says here, the chart below shows the total number of minutes and billions of telephone calls in the UK divided into three categories from 1995 to 2002. That's what you're putting in your first sentence, but in your own words. Don't copy their language because that's not your writing, you have to put it in your own words. Note that changing the form of a word, like changing a noun to an adjective or an adjective to a verb, that counts as paraphrasing. Then you write a general overview. The general overview is like the thesis statement in an essay, but we don't call it a thesis because a thesis is an argument. There's no argument here, it's just a description. And in this general overview, if you can avoid it, don't include specific data. You save the specific data for the body paragraphs. If you were to include the specific data in the general overview, there's two problems with that. One, it confuses the reader. It's too much information too quickly. Second, if you give specific data in the general overview, what are you gonna talk about in the body paragraphs? It'll be redundant. So general overview, try to avoid specific data. Just the broad patterns. It's like you're making a, it's like you're painting a picture using words. And how many body paragraphs? One to three body paragraphs as appropriate. You will need to use your best judgment. If there are two obvious patterns, which seems to be the average, then you're gonna use two body paragraphs. You can have shorter three body paragraphs. Sometimes one body paragraph is appropriate. Okay, so body paragraph one is gonna be the main pattern in the data. Start off with the topic sentence. And that's the main pattern described in general terms. Next, it's followed by evidence, supporting data for the main pattern. And you can end with a significant statement which explains what is the point of this data, okay? It's generally connected with the topic sentence, basically reiterates how that data is connected to this topic sentence. Body paragraph two, it's exactly the same thing. Second main pattern in the data, topic sentence, another main pattern described in general terms, supported with evidence, and at the very end, what's the point of the data? Okay, in terms of coherence and cohesion, just as with the essay, 
you have to watch out for referencing. Referencing means that things like pronouns, it's clear what they refer back to. That's why it's called referencing. Pronouns refer back to uh, specific nouns. So if you start off by saying people and then you switch to he, you're getting band six on coherence and cohesion because he doesn't match people, it confuses the reader. Here's a rule of thumb. Anything that causes confusion, you're not getting band seven. Whether that's a grammar issue that causes confusion, you're not getting band seven. Vocab issue that causes confusion, you're not getting band seven. Referencing causes confusion, you're not getting band seven. Okay, and the first time you mention an idea in a paragraph, use the full name or the full description. Don't start by saying it, because again, it's confusing. The reader doesn't know what you're referring to. Uh, lexical resource, basically the same criteria as with the essay. For band seven, you can only have occasional errors that have zero impact on communication. Okay, band six, it says makes some errors in grammar and punctuation, but they rarely reduce com uh, communication. Rarely reduce communication, if you flip that around, means sometimes reduce communication. Anything that causes a little bit of confusion, it drops you down to a band six. Solution, read your work out loud. Let your ears tell you if anything sounds awkward. And the rule applies, if in doubt, leave it out. Replace anything that sounds awkward with a simpler word or phrase that you are sure is okay. Grammatical range and accuracy for band seven, you can only have a few errors. So again, read your work out loud, let your ears tell you if anything sounds awkward. Okay, and just as a reminder, Present simple and past simple are the most commonly used verb tenses, so don't go crazy trying to use some really uncommon grammar because it isn't frequently used in English. Chances are you probably won't need to use it. You should use passive voice two or three times to show that you're able to use it and watch out for the three killers. Run on sentences, fragments, and subject verb agreement. This will destroy your score. These are, like, these are like systematic problems that indicate that you haven't, that you, that there's big gaps in your understanding of grammar. Uh, sorry, you have a question? What does this mean like using passive voice? To work? Uh, passive voice, simple example is, This is active voice. The bakers bake the bread at 5 a.m. So in English, verbs have tenses and they also have voice. Tense and voice are two different things. Passive voice would be, instead of starting with the bakers, the agent of the action bake, you would start with what's known as the patient, which is the bread. And you just start with the bread, Okay, Allah, how do we transform the verb? Okay. Okay, so what do we do to the verb to put it in passive voice? Can anyone help out Allah? Sir, I just, I didn't hear you because like the connection is so weak. Okay, how Can do you, you try- question? Yep. How do you transform bake into passive voice? Passive voice? Uh, mm -hmm. Like the bread baked by the bakers? Very close. Is baked at 5 a.m. You could say by the bakers. But this is baby English. Yes. Passive voice is appropriate when the subject of a verb is so obvious that the sentence just sounds very childish because it, 
just bakers bake bread, right? It's not police. It's not the mayor of the city. It's just bakers. So we don't need to say bakers. So it's better English if you say the bread is baked at 5 a.m. Okay. It's common. People have a lot of trouble with it. For band seven, they need to see that you can use it properly. Let's look at a model. Okay, let me have, uh, who do we have here? Okay, Rama, can you read the first part, please? Uh, should I read the question or only the multiple? Uh, we already we already read the prompt, so just the uh, okay. just the first part. Okay. Um, the bar chart shows how many minutes and billions of telephone calls were made from 1995 to 2002 locally, uh, nationally, and internationally by mobile phone. Overall, it can be seen that the number of local fixed line calls started and finished at the same point, while international calls and, and calls made by mobile increased significantly. Okay, good. Keep going. The time spent on local telephone calls rose at first, but then decreased st steadily, ending at the same level at which it started. Local calls from fixed lines started at just over 70 billion minutes in 1995 and climbed steadily to 90 billion by 1999, which was the highest number in the given period. However, from 1999, the number decreased to just over 70 billion by 2002. Yet, local fixed line calls were still the most common way of making phone calls. In contrast, national and international fixed line calls, as well as mobile calls, fo followed, uh, followed a different pattern. National and international fixed line calls started at 37 billion minutes in 1995 and grew year on year to 60 billion minutes by 2002. This trend was also seen in the figures for time spent on calls using mobile phones, old calls. In 1995, approximately 2 billion minutes of calls were made on a mobile, and this number grew to around 13 billion by 1999. Yet, from 1999, this number increased rapidly to 45 billion by 2002, by far the largest increase in the chart. Okay, very nice reading. Okay, any questions about the vocabulary? Pretty straightforward vocabulary, right? Yes, yes. No big words here. This is band nine. Um, Allah. Yes. Can you find any examples of passive voice in this passive text? Voice. Yeah. There's there are a few examples of passive voice. I wonder if you can find them. The, here it is, national and national fixed line calls. So that's that's a noun. We're we're looking for passive voice verbs. Three. I think I can find three. I see three examples. Uh, sorry, what was that? C, um, the first paragraph, overall, it can be seen that blah, blah, blah. Is that right? It yes, can it, can be, that. it can be seen. Yes, that's mm -hmm. passive voice. And uh, on the first part of the paragraph, uh, the time spent. I think the time which was spent. Yes. Uh, no, sorry, second one. The first, uh, yeah, the time spent. 
So this is a passive participle. Participle, yeah. It's yes. So it's another example of passive. Okay, so I found three passive voice verbs, but this is another passive participle. So we've still got two passive voice verbs in here. Can anyone find another one? The last uh, paragraph starts in nineteen ninety five. Approximately two billion minutes of calls were made. Were made. Uh, that's it. Right, yes. and this is why you want to use passive voice because what's the subject here? If we didn't use passive voice, we'd have to say who made the calls, right? So who made these calls? People. The people. 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 Right. Yes. So people is not a people is not a strong subject of a verb because we're not talking about cats and dogs, right? It's super clear that obviously these calls were made by human beings. So it's not great writing to say people made two billion minutes of calls. Two billion minutes of calls were made. Okay. And uh, uh, in the paragraph which started with in contrast, mm -hmm. there is uh, this maybe second or third sentence. This trend was also seen. Was also seen. It's, it's better than saying we can also see. Yes. Okay. Anything else? I see another passive participle, but it's the same one that you found earlier. Spent time spent. Yes. Time that was spent. Okay, so we've got three examples of passive voice verbs and two examples of passive participles. Shows that you can do it. Okay, so I have some questions just to help you understand why this author made, um, made these choices when, when he was writing. Let's see if I can fit this whole thing together. If it's too small, please let me know. So where did the author get the information for the first sentence in the introduction. First sentence in the intro, where did the author find this info? From the question. It's from the question. It's completely automatic. You take the prompt, you put it in your own words, that is your first sentence. Remember, writing proceeds from general to specific. This description that they give you at the top, that is the most general description of this thing that you're looking at. Okay. Where does the author describe the main point of the graph? Uh, the second sentence. Yes. Yes. Overall. No? Yeah. And the general overview You'll always start it with a set, with a word or a phrase like overall or generally speaking, in general, in general terms. It can be seen that the number of fixed line calls started and finished at the same point. So that's these red bars. They go up, they go down to the same level. While international calls and calls made by mobiles increased significantly. And that's the green bar and the blue bar. Right? And that's the big picture of what's happening in this graph. By the way, there's another passive participle in that sentence. Can you find it? Calls made by mobiles. Yes. Calls that were made by mobiles. Made by mobiles. This is just like a thesis statement. This gives you the main idea of this graph. And so just like the thesis statement, um, in the essay, the thesis statement, if you have your two supporting reasons, your two body paragraphs are going to be an expansion of those two supporting reasons. So here in the general overview, when you've got like the two main patterns, your body paragraphs will then be those two patterns. Don't deviate from that. It just confuses the reader if you do so. Okay. Is any specific data mentioned in the introduction? No. 
No. This is a very short task. Don't put any details in the beginning. If you put any kind of details in the beginning, it would be really repetitive. You would, you would struggle with what to write in the body paragraphs if you put those numbers in the intro. Also, just from a, it, when, if you're giving a presentation, if you're writing a report, you don't put specific details in the intro. It'll just go right over the reader's head. They'll be super confused if you do that. They need the context first before you provide the supporting details. Okay, body paragraph one, what's the purpose of the first sentence? It's saying like the local phones has like decreased started like a saying like it started like in 1995 it started at 70 and then it ended 2002 also by 70 at the same mm -hmm. point now look back at the general overview yeah so he's, the repeating. Yeah. he's repeating in different words yeah exactly like the essay exactly the same pattern of writing. This is good writing. Okay. A lot of people think this is overly simplistic. The reader understands. Why are we being, isn't this baby English? No, it's not. If you're writing this, then this information is clear to you. You've spent a lot of time with it, but your reader or your audience has not, they don't know what you know. So everything that you think is obvious to your audience is not obvious. It's obvious to you because you're familiar with the info, but it's not obvious to your audience. Audiences love this because when someone is reading your work, their major goal is just to understand what you want to communicate. And the easier you make it for them, the more appreciative they will be. Again, you're not writing for yourself, you're writing for an audience. You're the expert, your audience is not the expert. Um, after the, this first sentence in this body paragraph, what's the purpose of the next sentences? He's saying like in 1990, 1995, it was the highest. Mm -hmm. so, so like here, is he, here he started to specify mm -hmm. and going general and giving data to yeah so it started with the the beginning of the graph in 95 goes up to the peak okay and then the author mentions it was the highest number in the given period yeah. okay so that's that's where you point out the patterns and then afterwards from 1999 the number decreased to 70 billion by 2002. Now, what's the purpose of this last part here? What is the purpose? Yeah. He's describing the paragraph. Like it's still, I think, because, um, it just explains the point of the data to show the significance of mm -hmm. the pattern. Oh, significant, yes. Yeah, so, so what? Well, even though it's been on a downward trend in 2002, it's still the highest number at that point. Okay, so it's not just, it's not just mindless description of the data. There has to be a little bit of analysis in that sense. Yes. Okay, you have to explain what is the point of all this data. So let's have a look at the second body paragraph. What's the purpose of the first sentence? Uh, it is like a topic sentence. So it's explained the main uh, uh, idea of the second body paragraph, which is here, it's, uh, 
explain the other two types of calls, national, international calls. And uh, both of them, they are opposite the first one. Right. It, this is called parallelism and structure. Parallel structure. It's very reader friendly. Okay, what's the point of the next sentences? He's giving data. Mm -hmm. All right, so we took the next category, the green one, national, international, fixed line calls. Just like with the local fixed line calls, giving the starting point, and grew year on year to 60 billion minutes by 2002. This is a really simple, uh, this part of the graph is really, really simple. It doesn't go up and down. There's no, uh, there's no peaks, there's no troughs. It's just very slow and steady increase. Look, here we have, what's this? Another basically introductory sentence. Right, this sentence here, what does it do? Uh, to transition to the next uh, category, the mobile phones. Yes, and that's our overview. Exactly, and that's our final category uh, of data that the author is describing. Again, the introductory sentence avoids data because that can be confusing for the reader. And then this is followed by data. the data. Okay, from 1995 uh, to 1999. Why did the author do this? So the author used two sentences. This number grew from two to 13 billion by 1999. And then what happened from 1999? There's a rapid change that increased in the data. Yeah, so when the pattern changes, if it's like a meaningful, significant change, then that's what you need to describe. It's kind of goes up at a nice angle and all of a sudden the angle gets steeper of growth. And the author mentions that this is the largest increase in the chart. Okay, so even though national and international fixed line calls, uh, they're at a higher number, mobile calls increased at a higher rate. Yeah. And this is, this is always an important distinction to point out if you notice it, if you notice it. Okay, in that case, that's it for today. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I, no, that's that's it. That's the basic yeah. overview of writing task one academic for bar charts. These things can get more complicated when you have a bar chart plus, for example, a pie chart. But mm -hmm. just to get the basics, that's all there is to it. It's so very... Okay. <clears throat> There's like... And introduction and two body paragraph, right? You're going to have one to three body paragraphs, and it'll it'll vary based on the type of uh, the type of assignment you get. And like in this type of assignment, there is no conclusion. There is no nope. Oh, okay. Cool. Thank you, sir. Have a good night. Thank, Thank you. Have a good night. Uh, Thank take you. care. Have a good night, guys. Thank you. Take care. Bye. Be Bye. safe. Stay safe. Stay home. Stay away from people. <laughs> people are evil. <laughs> <laughs>